Chapter 9. The Future of the Christian School Culture is, as Henry R. Van Til has pointed out in The Calvinistic Concept of Culture, quote, religion externalized, end quote. The future of the Christian school is closely linked, as a result, with certain cultural and historical facts. If Christianity has lost the ability to create and maintain a culture, then the Christian school has a peripheral and dying function today. But if Christianity's cultural power remains yet to be manifested, then the Christian school has an essential and as yet unrealized role to play. Scripture gives us certain principles of cultural expectations. According to Hebrews 12, 18 to 29, History, from the giving of the law at Sinai to the coming of Christ, was subjected to a great shaking, to be followed by a second, Hebrews 12, 18 to 29, Matthew 24, from the fall of Jerusalem to the end of the world. The prophets addressed themselves to the implication of that first shaking, and the quote unquote major prophets gave us the roll call of the judgment of the nations in preparation for the advent of the messianic ruler and his kingdom. The purpose of this first shaking was to prepare the world for his coming, while the second shaking will destroy all false faith and refuges and make plain the implications of his coming, so that the things which alone cannot be shaken might remain. The book of Revelation is also addressed to this same question. Man will be allowed no false security, no hiding place, no paradise apart from God, and the relentless course of history is the destruction of all such attempts and the growing futility of flight or escape. The same subject is the concern of Matthew 13, 24-30, the tares and wheat parable which declares that the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness will become progressively more apparent. History is thus a process of epistemological self-consciousness and separation. The tares and wheat will grow side by side at the beginning, largely indistinguishable. Tares or darnel are pseudo-wheat, whose difference from wheat becomes manifest as maturity comes. As cultures come to maturity, they come to epistemological self-consciousness, and as world history develops and as a totality matures, the same process of maturation and self-consciousness will manifest itself Eschatology, thus, does not speak of an end that simply appears without causal connection to history, but as a culminating act to a process of culmination. To look backwards culturally, therefore, to the time of undifferentiation, is to resist the movement of history. Indeed, in times of cultural undifferentiation, quote, everybody goes to church, end quote, and the church often has simpler internal problems, but only because the tear has not recognizably and self-consciously become a tear, and the wheat has only a mild awareness of the demands and implications of his nature and position. The process of self-consciousness, therefore, involves a radical breakdown of the true church outwardly as a prelude to its realization of its strength and position realistically. Thus, while the Christian, as a participant in the events, can share in the common dismay at the tragedies and mounting crises of history, he must nevertheless welcome these crises as the necessary and God-ordained shaking of history. Even more than Augustine, he must recognize that the fall of his Rome is a necessary step toward the establishment of the kingdom of God. But the process of maturation and self-consciousness is twofold. The natural man, as he moves ahead in terms of an epistemological self-consciousness and awareness, steadily drops that form of conformity to godliness, purpose, meaning and social cohesion which once marked his life. There is progressively operative a radical disintegration of the natural man. The more obviously he becomes a tear, the more obviously he surrenders the appearance that made him earlier seemingly a part of the wheat field. There is therefore, in each maturing culture and in the totality of history as it matures, a progressive degeneration of the natural man, a process of self-consciousness which makes the forms of conformity more and more irrelevant and absurd. 
the description of Romans 1 becomes progressively more and more applicable. Meanwhile, the wheat must mature as wheat. In particular cultures, the process of self-consciousness can be readily pinpointed. Is it beginning to manifest itself in history as a whole? Is it present in some tentative and embryonic fashion in our own day? Are the elements of conformity and radical disintegration not merely in particular cultures, but in all cultures? Is a cultural crisis thus a worldwide one? To answer this question, let us first analyse a few aspects of the common life which are now in process of erosion. The further back we go in history, the more strongly we are impressed by the strong sense of community that once prevailed. However grim certain relationships were, a strong sense of human community characterised man. This can be extensively documented, perhaps never so beautifully as from Genesis 18. We find therein the ancient concept of hospitality clearly portrayed. Abraham, seated under the oaks of Mamre during the heat of the day, saw three strangers approaching. The identity of the strangers was unknown to him, but the fact that travel-weary strangers approached made immediate demands on Abraham. Any offence against hospitality was an unspeakable crime, of which only the most depraved were capable, Genesis 19.1-9, Judges 19-20. Accordingly, Abraham immediately went forward and in greeting said, My lord, if now I have found favour in thy sight, Pass not away from thy servant, end quote, and offered shelter and food. Granted that this greeting represented a formal and ritual approach, it was still indicative of the fact that hospitality was both a responsibility or requirement as well as a privilege. A stranger, if not an enemy to be killed, was a brother to be received. This same concept prevailed very strongly among Arabs, despite their cultural decline until the past century but now is in rapid erosion. Archaeologists in Palestine found it necessary to eat salt, that is, share a common meal with a local sheikh, as a kind of incorporation into his people. Every meal involved an affirmation of community and an act of incorporation, of which the sacrament of the Last Supper is a ritual reminder. Originally, it was the common meal of the Christian people or race, as contrasted to the table of demons. Among the older generation of Paiutes and Shoshones in Nevada, people who have of late rapidly passed on, the same concept of community was apparent. Other Indians could come to the Western Shoshone Reservation confident of a welcome and a place to stay, even to remain for lengthy months. No matter how crowded and limited the host's facilities, a one-room cabin and a host of children, the stranger was made welcome. Orphans similarly had no problem, They moved into another family at will. By contrast, the white man was a cold and inhospitable monster, and Christians, peculiar people who talked about love and welcomed no one. But he had certain presuppositions common to men, and certain obligations binding on host and guest. Today these things have become impossibilities. What men could once expect of strangers, they can no longer expect of their own children or dare ask for. The sense of community is rapidly disappearing, and even those rural areas which were once the strongholds of such solidarity now see its erosion. In virtually every part of the world, the sense of community is giving way to the erosive forces of modern life and the overriding control of the state. Society is giving way to the state. And communities exist not only as created and developed by minorities against the current, but there can be no return to the old solidarity. Mankind's epistemological self-consciousness is divisive of such unity, and on the part of the unregenerate, increasingly hostile to such private communication and interdependence. Another area now subject to rapid erosion is the family. The centrality of the family in biblical culture is clear-cut. The two most serious crimes were offences against God and offences against the family. In many cultures, the most fearful crime of all was parricide, an offence that rendered the guilty hateful even to himself. 
A man without a family was a contradiction, an object of distrust and suspicion. The family undergirded every aspect of man's life, and in Scripture, the very concept of salvation was in terms of a kinsman-redeemer. The authority of the family was strong and fundamental, not an oppressive power, but a supporting authority. The family today, however, in all its varieties, is subject to rapid disintegration everywhere, and only the modern atomistic and eroded family survives in many areas. Polyandrous family of Tibet is now being subjected to the disintegrating power of communism, and the old family system of China has been forcibly broken up. In Africa, tribe and family alike are surrendering to Western corrosion, and the handwriting is on the wall for the Eskimos no less than the jungle folk of the world. Outside of the world of Jesus Christ, the family is steadily breaking down. Family culture is in a rapid process of deterioration everywhere, and as man's crisis is stepped up and the shaking of the nation increases, the old forms of life disappear more rapidly, and there is no return to the past. In the past, as with the fall of Rome, familistic culture reappeared because the collapse did not carry all peoples in the empire with it. Moreover, in social catalysis today, there is no agent that itself remains stable while witnessing or precipitating change. The family in particular is no longer a bystander, but itself one of the first subjects of social change. And the family itself, outside limited areas, has abdicated its authority in favour of state and school and become a peripheral institution. Psychiatrists and sociologists, in attempting to revive family culture, emphasise its psychic significance in the development of the child and the emotional health of the adult, and rightly so. But this is to stress one value alone of the home, its ancient religious, educational, economic and social centrality is not considered, nor its recall desired. At best, the family is given a limited scope in terms of the future. The sense of function and calling is another area of erosion. Only a broken and dying culture fails to manifest in its members a strong sense of calling. This is today conspicuous by its absence. No quote-unquote primitive culture has been found in which this sense of calling is absent. It was once held that the Aboriginal women of Australia, believed to represent the quote-unquote lowest known culture, lacked any sense of function or calling. The Long Study of Phyllis M. Caberi, Aboriginal Woman, Sacred and Profane, 1939, clearly depicts the strong sense of sacred function of Aboriginal women in Australia. Imbued with a sense of sacred function, they have a dignity together with a deep satisfaction in their work. Here, as elsewhere, it is westernisation which destroys the dignity of position and renders every function profane, empty and meaningless. In biblical faith, man has a calling as a prophet, priest and king in Christ and a cosmic significance to his office. But modern man lacks calling. He has excellent working conditions, but no sense of vocation. As cultures everywhere are secularised, they are emptied of meaning. Since culture is religion externalised, the absence of faith means the debauching of culture and its petrification or collapse. And petrification, once possible as with China and Japan, is increasingly less possible as the world comes closer to the door of the sleeping culture and more readily threatens its peace. Men who once lived to work now work to play, to seek escape from responsibility and the pursuit of meaning. Thus, man is steadily losing everything that makes him man, everything that characterises him as created in the image of God. What Van Til has called earlier creation grace is in rapid process of erosion and death. Man is obliterating everything that once made his life significant because he hates signification. As a result, the characteristic temper of modern man is a perpetual state of anxiety. Anxiety because his life means nothing. Anxiety because he is constantly burdened by the fact that he has no true burden. During World War II, mental health improved as men gained a cheap quote-unquote cause by means of the war. 
and at no cost to their desire for an easy conscience, but it was a short-lived and sickly health. It was a borrowed and short-term meaning. A meaningless and purposeless people are dangerous in that they lost after easy causes and cheap meanings. We find in war and hatred easy causes and convenient demons to exercise. A vivid picture of the radical irrationality and meaninglessness of modern man has been given by Georges Simenon in the novel The Man Who Watched the Trains Go By, 1946. Life is a parcel of senseless rules, and the sucker is the man who persists in following them. The course of wisdom is, quote, to be first to break the rules, end quote, and in that way be, quote, sure of not being had, end quote, man being purposeless and without calling, when the routine of his life is broken, readily surrenders all the moral standards and principles which were part of that routine, quote, nobody obeys the laws if he can help it, end quote. Key's Poppinga, having no fundamental faith, quickly deteriorates into a common criminal, but both his respectability and criminality were each in turn accidental and without conviction. He was pliable to circumstance and incapable of direction. On his arrest, he sought to write an autobiographical excuse entitled, quote, The Truth About the Keys Poppinka Case, end quote, but found himself unable to write a word, concluding, quote, Really, there isn't any truth about it. Is there, Doctor? End quote. This perceptive novel is unhappily all too accurate. Modern men without faith tends to be a waste basket into which miscellaneous experiences fall without purpose or meaning. As a result, he substitutes analysis for meaning, in that dissection more becomes him than direction. Morton White has aptly called this the age of analysis. Philosophically, that analysis has involved a radical evasion of any concept of a worldview or a metaphysics. The traditional concerns of philosophy are bypassed, as are the issues of public and private life, the problems of culture, art and politics, for a childish and idealistic analysis of language. Meanwhile, in every area, the erosion increases, and man's life becomes more and more meaningless as he is stripped of every structure and form of life except the monolithic state. This is to be expected. The biblical philosophy of history is insistent that the natural man's life does not stand still but moves steadily to epistemological self-consciousness. And the deterioration and degeneration his awareness involves. Indeed, the true church is summoned to prepare herself for the day of full cultural responsibility, as witness Paul's appeal, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2, quote, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust, and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if this world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? End quote. The word judge is here used in the Old Testament sense to govern. The saints are to govern the world ultimately as alone capable of giving direction, meaning and cultural form to life in its every aspect. In view of this eventuality, the church must prepare herself by her own internal self-government, by a developed capacity to deal with her problems, by the development of her life in every avenue of home school and vocation, and by the philosophical development of her faith in terms of all knowledge and science, for the Christian's function as salt-bearer, that is, preserving force and governor of the world, the cultural collapse is accelerated. God alone can become the source of culture and meaning, and the Christian becomes the cultural force and agent. Natural man is destroying family, community, society, everything that makes life livable, destroying the meaning of work, destroying the meaning of function, and even destroying meaning as such, in that current theories of semantics imply that meaning in itself is obsolete. The summons to a sleeping church are clear-cut, quote, What, know ye not that the saints are to judge the world? End quote. This is no time for smug pietism and withdrawal, 
there is no luxury of being raptured out of problems. The kingdoms of this world are to become kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Meanwhile, as the crisis develops, men's hearts feel them for fear. If the cultural destiny of man apart from God is degeneration, then the cultural destiny of the true and consistent Christian must be regeneration. There is no escaping this responsibility. To evade it is to become salt without savour, cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. We have, therefore, an imperative need for Christian education for the development of a Christian university in terms of Christian theistic epistemological presuppositions. We need to recognize that nothing is more short-sighted and tragic than the limitations of Christianity to ecclesiastical objectives when its responsibility is in terms of the whole of life and Jesus Christ is presented in Scripture as mediator of a cosmic as well as a personal redemption. Man is called to exercise his image mandate in knowledge, righteousness, holiness and dominion, subduing the earth agriculturally, scientifically, culturally, artistically, in every possible way asserting the crown rights of King Jesus in every realm of life, claiming the kingdoms of this world as the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. The standard of Jesus Christ must be erected in every field of life. This is the fundamental task of Christian education, with the recognition of its growing responsibility as present realities are shaken, that the unshakable might alone remain. In terms of all this, the Christian cannot limit his functioning to the institutional church, nor become a power manipulator or placid or stoical bystander. As Henry Van Til has pointed out, culture is not a neutral enterprise. Because Christianity encompasses the totality of life, it must become, in its totality, the source of culture. Quote, For a people's religion comes to expression in its culture, and Christians can be satisfied with nothing less than Christian organization of society. End quote. 